Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Greg Gottlieb. I'm with the Feinstein International Center at the Friedman School of Nutrition at Tufts University. Uh, we're uh, glad everybody can make it today uh, to discuss how the pathways to resilience in pastoral areas of East Africa are evolving. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, the audio can be a little bit tricky on WebEx. So click connect using computer in the circle on the left of your screen. This webinar is scheduled for an hour and we will end on or before that. Um, we're looking forward to an engaging conversation. We'll have plenty of time for uh, questions and answers at the end and we'll begin compiling questions throughout the session. So. Uh, I encourage everybody to use the chat function to ask questions as they come to mind. On the top right of your screen, you should see a blue icon for chat. Click this to open a chat box. You can send questions at any point, and we will get to as many as we can in the last 20 minutes or so of the session. Finally, just to let everyone know, we are recording this webinar. Finally, um, the webinar is part of the project titled Synthesizing Research on Resilience in Dryland and Fragile Contents, which is funded by the USAID Center for Resilience. And through the project, the Feinstein International Center at Tufts synthesized our research from the past decade or more on three major themes related to resilience. First was the conflict and resilience nexus. This one is the various pathways to resilience, particularly for pastoralists. And finally, there are the drivers of persistent global acute malnutrition. These syntheses are designed to provide policymakers and practitioners with insights and recommendations that emerged from a pretty rigorous evidence synthesis across studies and contexts. This is the second of three webinars, one on each topic. And today we're focused on resilience in pastoral areas of East Africa and how things are changing there. Uh, from my own personal perspective on this, before we get going, um, I am particularly taken with the importance of the resilience approach. Um, this work that we're doing is part of a kind of a broader effort to understand how to improve the resilience of vulnerable communities. And there's nothing really, there's nothing new in that concept. We've always, as development professionals, I think, been trying to do this. However, um, the difference for me that I see now is how the community is organized itself around the resilience concept. Uh, when I was in my previous career with USAID uh, and out in East Africa in 2011 and 2012, we looked at the drought there in East Africa, but also West Africa, and realized that we had been doing some things uh, wrong. We really had not been combining our development money with our relief money. When we looked at a map, we saw that our development money, at least from the USAID perspective, was in one part of the country and one part of the area, and our relief money was completely up in the area of drought. And so we really weren't getting the most out of our money. And the effort that we started with uh, then was to just try to be be better at combining that money. However, I think in the last many years, uh, the resilience concept has led us to move from that sort of more narrow focus to the much broader focus now of not only looking at things, uh, not only doing more research, but also having donors broaden the programs that they bring to those areas. I wanna, in a way, uh, just say that I think for the Center for Resilience has greatly helped shape the research agenda, providing uh, really important evidence for policymakers about the investments in resilience programming. Um, and this synthesis work, I think, will help further the evidence available to practitioners and policymakers. So with that, um, today we have three outstanding panelists. First, we have Andy Catley, who's the research director at the Feinstein International Center, Tufts, and he's the author of Pathways to Resilience in Pastoralist Areas. 
a recent report that synthesizes Feinstein's research from the past 15 years in the Horn of Africa on this topic, and he'll present the key findings from this report. Peter Little is the Dobbs Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Global Development Studies Program at Emory University. During the past 30 plus years, he has worked and written on several topics related to pastoralism in the Horn of Africa, including food security, livestock markets and trade, and livelihood diversification. Finally, Ian Schoons is a professor at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex and leads the new European Research Council project, Pastres, Pastoralism, Uncertainty and Resilience. He co-edited with Andy Catley and Jeremy Lin the 2013 book, Pastoralism and Development in Africa, Dynamic Change at the Margins. All of these panelists bring long and varied experience and we appreciate their time today. We know that many of you online also have extensive experience and I encourage you to participate in the conversation via your chat function. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Andy to give us an overview of the topic and get the conversation started. Andy? Thanks very much, Greg, and good morning to everyone. Uh, as you say, Greg, I'd like to out outline some of the main findings from the center's recent synthesis reports. And I'll start with a very clear and I hope positive finding. This is that pastoralist livestock production and marketing really still dominates the economies of the dryland areas, as well, of course, contributing hugely to, to national and, and regional economies. Um, you know, although we still often hear people talking about pastoralists as, as isolated from markets or even market averse, in reality, they supply huge numbers of animals to markets in the region. And of course, countries like Ethiopia, Somalia, and others are, are major exporters of livestock as well. And with these animals, you know, mainly coming from, from mobile production systems in, in lowland areas. And just to, to illustrate the points, if we look at uh, the Berber report in Somalia, that, that port alone exported just over 3 million animals in 2016, even though there was a major drought affecting parts of the region from, from 2015 onwards. And this, this kind of brings me to my second point, which is about the resilience of, of production. Um, we know that, that many pastoral areas are, are very underdeveloped with very poor infrastructure. They've been subject to, to chronic problems such as conflict and drought. But despite this, they, they consistently produce huge numbers of animals for markets. And to me, this, this indicates there's something that is, is fundamentally resilient about the production system itself and the logic of, of livestock rearing in these areas. But my third point really is more about the changes in these areas, which we're seeing as, as pastoralism becomes more commercialized and, and recognizing that the commercialization processes have been going on for many decades in, in some of these areas. And the point really is that, that not everyone benefits from these changes around commercialization, uh, especially as, as populations grow, as people's access to rangeland becomes more difficult, and when we still have major droughts. And essentially what we're seeing is, is a gradual shift in livestock from, from smaller to larger herds, or, or put another way, from from poorer to wealthier herders. And it's really the better off herders and owners who supply most of the animals to, to both domestic region, to both domestic and, and international markets and, and capture the benefits of that market engagement. And it's really these kinds of changes that are the, the basis for the moving up, moving out analysis in the report. Uh, in other words, there's a, there's a clear pathway to a certain type of resilience for, for those pastoralists who have enough animals, who can grow their herds, and who can be strategic about when they sell livestock. 
and at the same time it tends to be these these wealthier and more influential people who tend to take over rangeland or water for their own personal use and so we see this long-term process of the privatization of the rangelands in some places and from a drought perspective uh, if you're relatively well off well the more animals you have at the start of a drought the more likely it is that you'll have some animals left at the end so the moving up moving out analysis in the report is, is really the idea that a mix of, of population growth commercialization climate variability and other factors make it possible for some people to stay in pastoralism and do very well but also for other people to be to be pushed out or at least find it increasingly difficult to stay in so for us the trick for for understanding changes in pastoral systems has been to look at them in terms of different wealth groups and the mixes of pathways that are open to these different groups um, so these are these are some of the main issues in the report dealing generally with pastoralism and commercialization and I'll hand back to you Greg thanks Andy thanks much um, let me just turn if I can to Peter to hear his reflections on uh, these initial findings Peter thanks Greg and um, thank you to Andy and, 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 the, and the Feinstein team for, for producing a, a really first-class uh, piece of work over over uh, a number of years um, I think it's a it's a real uh, powerful document um, well let me let me start by saying um, that in terms of the questions of resilience in, in the dynamism of pastoralism is um, there's quite a bit of change that that has been going on within these pastoral systems and there and there are many types of, of pastoral systems even in even in the Horn of Africa Eastern Africa um, that one observes that that really makes them more resilient um, and 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 again with the focus on mobility um, trucking of water and fodder we're seeing uh, the uh, even the planning of, of fodder in some cases um, the evolution over time where we've seen where where, where populations uh, human populations are increasingly less mobile uh, staying in base settlements and so on but the livestock remain mobile and I think the emphasis here is 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 mobility as, as being a key, whether it's in a ranching system in the southwest U.S., which trucks animals, or or in in a pastoral system in the Horn of Africa. Other innovations, uh, one uh, mobile phones, uh, mobile phones and, and telecom has has really begun to affect where where people are able to trans transmit information, not just about markets, but also about range condition in different areas, security conditions in different areas. Um, as well as the use of, 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 new, of veterinary inputs, uh, where, which al allow uh, herders to, to move animals, uh, making the system more resilient to, to, to areas that are higher rainfall, but may be more susceptible to disease like, like, like sepsi fly, uh, trypanosomiasis. Um, we're also um, seeing uh, a lot of selective in, uh, breeding of animals uh, within and, and a, a, a adapting of, of more drought resistant um, species um, such as uh, uh, goats and, and, and camels and, and that's been fairly well documented but these systems again and, and again making these systems uh, increasingly um, resilient um the uh question that that andy andy raised also about markets um and i think this is still a challenge and, and while while it's it, there's no question that that these pastoral lowland areas are contributing tremendous amounts uh but by, by far the majority in some cases over 90 percent in certain countries of the animals for that valuable livestock trade uh, we uh, are still challenged in, 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 in ensuring that more and more that value stays within the pastoral areas. A lot of that economic value is, 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 is leaving the pastoral areas. And um, so that, that pastoralists themselves through, through prices and, and so on aren't capturing as much value as they can, particularly in the export trade, uh, the overseas high value export trade. Um, so I think that the the questions of, of trade and commercialization also deals with the questions of what markets to emphasize. 
Um, a lot of a lot of countries in the Horn, because of foreign exchange and so on, emphasize the high value uh, export trade. But we know, and in, 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 in there's been some research, we're, we're doing some now, uh, a group uh, working with me on, on sort of what the values are of regional trade, uh, including transporter, which is also international trade, as well as um, producing for national and domestic markets. Um, in some cases, the, the Nairobi and the Addis Ababa uh, meat market may be, in some cases, more profitable. Um, than, than the export for, for pastoralists and, and smaller traders and so on. So I think those are, those are the kinds of things that are going on that are making these systems uh, more resilient. And for those that like to talk about the end of pastoralism, um, you know, again, uh, in these dryland areas where, where rain is, is so uh, heterogeneous, both spatially and, and temporally, um, Mobility, the movement of animals, is still going to remain the key, as it has throughout the world, not just in, in the Horn of Africa. So um, I'll leave it at that, and, and back to you, Greg. Uh, thanks very much, Peter. Uh, Ian? Thank you, uh, Greg, and thank you, Andy, and the Feinstein team for this fantastic report. I just want to join Peter and others in congratulating you on it. It's well worth a read. Because I think the most important thing it says is pastoralism is changing, and, and indeed there are many types of pastoralism out there. Sometimes we get stuck in sort of ideal, idealized versions of what pastoralism is, either the sort of depressing version of the, you know, the narrative de of decline that Peter just mentioned, that uh, pastoralism is finished, people must settle, agriculture is the only option, or sometimes a rather um, misjudged, naive romanticism that actually the past, some ideal past, can be resurrected. So I think what this report does, and particularly the moving up and moving out framework, which really focuses on, in on processes of differentiation within pastoral societies, helps us really get to grips with how a variety of drivers, whether it be climate change or population growth or changing resource access or changing markets, makes uh, pastoralism a much more diverse set of activities uh, in these uh, uh, dry rangelands uh, than was perhaps the case in the past. Um, and I think this points to the question of, of what do we mean by resilience, because resilience has to be associated with particular uh, types of activity. And in reading the report, it, I recalled a, a scenarios exercise we did some years ago with Ethiopian pastoral leaders and, and policymakers, where we thought about different dimensions of, of change in the rangelands in Ethiopia in this setting, very similar to other parts of the Horn, um, where changing resource access and changing market access were seen to be the key drivers affected by a variety of different shocks and stresses. And again, we came out with a whole variety of different scenarios, including the ones mentioned in this report. Um, commercial produ production on the rise, for sure. Large herds, um, often controlled by uh, absentee herders, very often male, um, but focusing increasingly on export markets. Alongside pastoral production of the more traditional sorts, focusing on informal and local markets, and as Peter was emphasizing, both of these totally reliant on, on mobility. But there were other types of pastoral production and relations with livestock emerging in the areas too, uh, alternative livelihoods of different sorts, and of course people dropping out at the same time, so there's a cycling of, of people moving through. So overall, I think this report should be commended particularly because of its sophisticated approach to livelihoods analysis. Um, moving up, moving out. I mean, there are other livelihoods frameworks that uh, uh, participants in this webinar may may know about, such as the one that Andrew Dawood and colleagues produced, which similarly looks at stepping up, stepping out, hanging in. There are lots of different ways that people are engaging um, with these systems. But the question of resilience, and in turn the question of what development aid and interventions do, has to be attuned to this new diversity and differentiation. And I think this report goes a long way to help us to get our heads around what that might be. So do read it. Um, 
anyway, that's enough from me for now. So back to you, Greg. Thank you. You've been very uh, great. Um, before I move on to the next topic, I think, you know, as I listen to all three of you talk about it, uh, what's going on? Certainly, the word dynamic is the it seems to be the ver really appropriate word to describe what's been going on, uh, or that we've observed over the last 15 years. Because we've seen over those years any number of serious droughts. We've heard of almost you know we, we, we we've had drought described in cat catastrophic terms, and yet I think Andy, as you point out, um, exports out of Berber Report and elsewhere are fantastic. I know that in the last several years, Ethiopia itself has become a major uh, exporter, exporting, uh, you know, slaughtered meat into the Gulf. New markets are opening up. Uh, new technologies, the mobile phone is being applied. Uh, I think if anything we see over the, those years is, is the ability of those communities to change. And the challenge for development groups is how do we, instead of not get in the way, but how do we do the right thing to support what's going on? The whole discussion about uh, export markets and hard currency uh, is a good one because there may be other ways, as uh, Peter, you note, for more money to stay in those pastoralist areas, which would again help those places, uh, help them, those communities continue to thrive. So uh, really very interesting things going on. So let me move, if I can, to theme two, which is alternative and diversified livelihoods in the pastoralist areas. And um, we'll take a look at see what's happening to those to whom pastoralism is no longer a viable option. So uh, Andy, can I turn to you? Yeah, thanks. Thanks again, Greg. Um, perhaps just a, an initial point is that is when we when we talk about diversification in, in pastoral areas. Uh, of course, diversification is used by by all kinds of people, including uh, wealthy pastoralists who diversify as well as the poor, as well as as people who are falling out of pastoralism or who are forced out. Um, and forms of just diversification have, have been there for for a very long time. I think what we're seeing is is a huge mix of of diversification activities uh, associated with with very different livelihood aspirations and opportunities. Um, some people uh, may be trying to get back into pastoralism, but perhaps they don't have enough animals. They might be trying to earn some extra cash to help them rebuild their herds. Um, Others may be keeping a few animals, you know, because that's what they've always done, but they can't really survive without doing other things. And other people may have made a conscious decision to leave pastoralism or have been forced out by, by circumstance. Uh, and there's a lot of movement into and out of different activities over time and, and by different family members. So it's a very complex mix of of activity that's that's going on. But going back to the synthesis report, what was striking to me when I looked really not so much at our own research, but what other reports were saying, um, what was striking was the very large numbers of households that, that seemed to lack sufficient numbers of animals to function as pastoralists. So, for example, if we look at data from the evaluation of, of the safety net program in Ethiopia and, and rejig some of that data, it points to between 80 and 90 percent of households in some regions of Ethiopia um, not, not actually having enough animals to be pastoralists. And then there's a similar picture coming from, from research in parts of Kenya and Tanzania. So we we seem to have a situation where where livestock commercialization and growth is ongoing and and that will provide new jobs and opportunities in these areas, uh, for example, around livestock trade and markets, transportation of livestock and and processing of livestock products and this kind of thing. Uh, and there are increasing demands for for better education because people see education as a route to employment and a good income. <laughs> 
But at the same time, we also see many people engaged in, in what we might call negative diversification activities with, with, with bad social or environmental consequences, um, as well as um, increasing use of wage labor in and around towns. Uh, but often work which has very low wages and uh, is often exploitative, especially uh, for women. So I guess what worries me a little is the numbers, by which I mean that the difference in the growth of, of relatively good ways of making a living in pastoral areas versus the, the number of people who are currently limited to to negative diversification or, or wage labor with very low levels of income uh, or support from safety nets. And I think it's really for these reasons that the, the Moving Up, Moving Out discussion in the report talks about moving out of pastoralism for, for some people, but also moving out of pastoral areas. Uh, in other words, moving to other parts of the country or to other countries where, where opportunities are better. And finally, you know, if, if education is a critical pathway to better employment, we face the long-term problem of, of very weak education services in pastoral areas, and yet, you know, ongoing population growth on the, on the top of all of this. So I think some some major challenges facing pathways to resilience for people who are currently caught in in patterns of negative diversification. Um, so with those issues, I'll hand back to you, Greg. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, let me start this time with Ian. Okay, thank you, Greg, and thank you, Andy. I think this whole question about what happens when people can't uh, make a living or exclusively make a living out of, out of livestock is an absolutely crucial one and one that we haven't particularly got our head around very well. We, as you say, we... We know that there's a lot of diversification going on, but I think one of the big challenges is to think about, well, what type of positive diversification is happening and how can that be supported? Because as you hinted, there's really quite a lot, and particularly as pastoral systems change through the process of commercialization that we've been discussing, there are a whole array of different activities associated with marketing, brokers, traders, intermediaries of different sorts around transport of live animals or products or animal products or fodder or water or whatever. And indeed around production through fodder supply or processing from, from milk and so on. Now, while that's not going to generate livelihoods for everybody, and I agree there will be some people who will um, continue to be moving out of, of pastoral areas and pastoral, pastoralism completely, I think there are a variety of multipliers and linkages, to use the economics language, that do exist, and new ones that do exist in pastoral areas that we need to think about and think about how to, to accelerate and capitalize upon. Because we see across pastoral areas in the Horn and elsewhere, the growth of, of small towns, uh, and a, a change of, of, of urban and rural relations in these, in these economies, often facilitated through investments from diaspora, through remittances and so on. So I think there's a, a real opportunity to think, particularly for women and younger people who are often being left out of the growth of commercial uh, pastoralism, dominated as it is by large herds owned by men, uh, to think about what, what these small informal markets uh, can generate and what the most inclusive linkages and multipliers might be in those areas. And I think that's where the report does offer some, some, some ways of thinking about that because as, as you just mentioned, Andy, the, uh, the modeling that you do in the report shows that actually re investing in restocking may not be the best way of supporting livelihoods for many people because that uh, to get back to a minimum herd size to make that viable uh, is really a long shot for many. So investment in other things that may not be, as it were, in our minds classified as pastoralism style investments, I mean, basic infrastructure, roads, small town development, uh, 
may be perhaps the best bet for supporting these linkages and multipliers, particularly uh, for women and younger people whose building of their business skills and entrepreneurial capacity and so on may be uh, an important focus for linking alternative livelihoods to the changing uh, pastoral system. So I think uh, there are positives as well as negatives and uh, in, in thinking about the, the development challenges, obviously we need to think about both, but have a bit of a wider discussion about what positive linkages might be invested in. So on that, back to you, Greg. Thanks, Ian. Great, uh, great comments. Uh, Peter, let me go to you now. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I, I'm going to probably echo a little bit of what, what Ian has said, but um, as well as Andy. But I think one thing to, to keep in mind when we talk about diversification, and, and I think Ian's comments kind of hinted at it, is that if you if you look at the at the kind of regional level, again, the, the key being keeping more value in these regions that you know for development. Um, and so diversification uh, at a regional level still means focusing, um, again, livestock is the key resource in these dryland areas. And so any, any of these kind of positive uh, multipliers and diversification, whether it's in supporting trading, um, uh, lots of other kinds of activities, milk trading, which, which we know, which we know is, 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 is something that, that women uh, are heavily involved. Transport of some of these products are, are, are where youth are heavily involved, which are often um, not as centrally benefiting from, from livestock production per se. Um, again, these are the kinds of things that are, are really strong. And, and as Ann said, um, positive rural urban linkages uh, are, are really, really critical. And, and again, um, Anyone that's visiting these areas, when you go back and forth, the first thing you notice is, is often the, the, the growth in small towns. And again, um, we need to think about positive rural urban linkages because you, you know the growth of urban areas and towns and so on often can encroach on some of the better range areas. So we, we need to think carefully about that. Um, Lots of, as Andy has in the report points out, there's there's a there's a whole slew of negative diversification strategies. But this whole process of of populations being uh, being exited out of pastoralism goes back goes back centuries. I mean, that's how towns in the Middle East and other places often formed were were you know ex pastoralists and so on. So um, you know, but again, the emphasis on these kinds of positive things, and again, for development agencies and NGOs and others to to think about that. Um, I think one thing that that challenges us, I think, uh, as as researchers and so on, and, and the report deals with this um, very nicely, is you know the index that we use of of you know viability of pastoralism a population uh you know we use the per capita livestock units per population and so on 4.5 per capita is often used we need to think really much more creatively about about what a more diversified asset index would look like that you know because there's a lot of diversification by upper middle and better off pastoralists diversification to stay within pastoralism. And, and I frequently hear that from, from individuals that, you know, I've educated my, educated my son, he remits incomes from, from the city, or I've done farming so that I can stay within pastoralism. It allows me to, to mix these operations and, and so on. And I think we need to really think creatively uh, about this, uh, what, what, a, what a really a, a, a kind of an index of, of uh, of a new index of wealth that accounts for all of this kinds of diversification rather than just relying on on a livestock uh, index as an indicator uh, for diversification. So I think um, with, you know, again, it's a complicated topic. Uh, we'll probably revisit it uh, later in the discussion, but I, I think I'll leave it at that and uh, turn it back to uh, you, Greg. Thanks, Peter. And thanks to Andy and Ian. Um, before we go to the next topic. I mean, I think you guys have really raised some incredibly interesting points. If I step back into a sort of an old role of being from a donor, I would look at this and say, you know, one of the things we've done a lot of is that we've approached uh, post-drought work with a with that restocking uh, uh, 
lens and it, it bears, uh, Andy, I think the work that you've done shows, yeah, maybe that's not, that's maybe not the best way to go. And so perhaps what we need to do is a little bit more research on what are better avenues for that sort of recovery uh, and money to go into because, uh, and it also strikes me that uh, the issues around education in health that you raise, and uh, particularly around education as an alternative are ones that need to be looked at because as you point out, um, a lot of government policies in the areas don't support that. So I think for from uh, from in terms of what kind of programming we're gonna do, uh, we need to we need to relook at approaches we've taken in the past. And as you point out, Peter, um, taking a having a, a bit of a more diverse index uh might help us to understand that, right? Because we would understand what the uh pieces are that we need to look at to understand what is what wealth really looks like in the community. And finally, the other last thing I would say on it is that um, when we look at the commercialization of livestock, I think one of the questions I would ask is, um, you know, as it becomes a more commercial business, does some of the commercialization shift to the cities? And therefore, that is where the, you know, the wealth moves to other people who don't necessarily come from those communities or from people who were in those communities and have now shifted to the larger towns. My last trip to Uganda that I took with Andy actually showed, I think what you guys have said, the growth of those regional towns. It's remarkable what's happened in Uganda. So um, it'd be interesting to know who captures all that uh, commercial wealth. So let me now uh, switch to the final part of our um, discussion and that's on changing social relations. Um, and building on what we've discussed already, uh, let's take a look uh, with Andy first to see uh, really what's going on in that uh, area. Uh, Andy, over to you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Craig. Um, perhaps a starting point here really is to, to take a step back in time and, and remind ourselves that traditionally, you know, we know pastoralism is has relied heavily on on collective action to support livestock production and it's, it's a system that's been characterized by by communal access and management of, of rangeland and water and this was all for for very practical reasons people needed to cooperate to move livestock to water livestock and to provide security for themselves um, and at the same time you know various Social support systems are in place that that help people to to rebuild herds after after crises, particularly such as, as droughts or disease outbreaks. Um, but but as I was reminded a few days ago, of course these these systems evolved hundreds of years ago, whereas we now face issues such as as commercialisation and population growth and so on, as as we've already discussed. And so the, the sense of this report discusses various changes in, in social relationships over time that, that both affect livestock production on a day-to-day -day basis, but also uh, in relation to drought and the capacity of, of poorer households to recover from drought. Um, so in terms of the day-to-day -day production of livestock in, in pastoral areas, I think we all know that, that access to good rangeland is, is a critical aspect of pastoralism, uh, especially, especially during the dry season. However, we also know that from you know, the 1960s and probably before, there has been a process of, of rangeland closure and privatization, especially in areas associated with, with livestock commercialization. And typically, it's it's the better off, um, better connected people who are able to take control of, of rangeland and private enclosures. And in a sense, they they have the best of both worlds in terms of production because during the wet season they can they can use communal grazing areas with with other people and herds. But during the dry season, when things get tough they have exclusive access to their own enclosed rangeland uh, when pasturing other areas can be can be very limited 
So what we what we seem to be seeing is that, that commercialization prompts more individualistic behaviors among some people. And a view that that land that was previously communal and shared can now be more privately controlled. And I think what's what's interesting here is that when we look in the media, especially over the last one five years or so, this issue of, of land grabbing has been has been very prominent and has, has often been linked to with, with people from outside of pastoral areas with, with big politicians and companies and so on. But there is also this gradual trend within pastoral areas, a kind of an internal land appropriation by pastoralists themselves or former pastoralists that's, that's ongoing. And in terms of drought management, um, traditional social support systems are, are very varied, often involve transfers of livestock from, from wealthier to poorer herders after drought, or, or herders who have lost large numbers of animals. But there are various reports that these kinds of systems are under a lot of pressure. Uh, and I think this relates to to the numbers of people these days who, who need to rebuild their herds after drought, um, the, the capacity of better off herders to provide this, this support, these transfers, and I think a realization among wealthier herders that not everyone can return to pastoralism. And, and this brings us back to our discussion of a few minutes ago, which I think within some pastoral areas, there's a clear realization um, at community level that, that not everybody can be a successful pastoralist. Um, and you do hear accounts of changes in traditional social support systems. So for example, instead of, instead of giving people livestock, um, in some areas, they might ask people for a good business idea and then contribute cash rather than livestock to help people set up a small business. So there are examples of these changes in, in social support at the local level. And, and despite some of the, the more kind of worrying changes in social relations uh, and land uh, appropriation and so on, Social relationships and social connectedness are still very important. Um, and the center's research, for example, in Somalia uh, during drought clearly shows how survival can depend on assistance from relatives, but often relatives outside of pastoral areas or, or in other countries. Um, thanks, Greg, and back to you. Thanks, Andy. Um, first, uh, what I'm going to do here is turn to um, Peter and then Ian. But uh, guys, I'll ask you to keep it uh, relatively short because we have so many questions uh, that we want to try to get to. Okay, go ahead, uh, Peter. Okay, I'll, I'll just really um, harp on on one point. I, I, I agree with with much of what what Andy um, has mentioned, uh, particularly the uh, increased inequality. Um, and, and some of this internal uh, uh, as well as external land grabbing and so on that are altering social relations. I, I will just emphasize two points. Um, one of them, and many of you in the audience that have dealt with NGOs, um, deal with this, uh, this question of what's happening with community institutions that used to regulate access to grazing and, and how are these private private interests over overriding these kind of communal interests. And I think that's a huge question that, that continues to come up. And, and a lot of us, I think, may have may have written off the community, the community institutions, oh, they don't work anymore, blah, 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 without really supporting them and, and, and thinking carefully about, you know, because because some of these some of these institutions are still in place in, in, in some ways, but just have not received the support. And and in part it's because I think the government and the state we have different different levels of authority that have usurped a lot of this power, and in some cases, some of this this internal uh, grabbing of land and so on is taking place because there's a real vacuum between who really regulates access to grazing and, and, and can mediate conflict and disputes over land and so on. The second one I want to just emphasize quickly again on social relations that are changing are these community again other other kinds of institutions, whether it's for maintaining wells. Uh, even in some cases maintaining uh, enclosures and pasture lands and so on. Uh, 
And this is just a, a kind of footnote um, in, in terms of, of well maintenance, for instance, and work that we've looked at in, in, in the Barana areas, is that um, you know some of these safety net programs that are cash and food for work that are actually um, uh, paying people either in food and cash for maintaining wells and, and other things these, that, that, that they were maintaining tr traditionally uh, without food and cash payments uh, raises the question of what happens when these supports are, are pulled out. And I've observed that it has disrupted some of these social relations. So some of the development interventions themselves, whether it's in marketing or resource management, have, have implications on social relations. So I will leave it at that. And uh, back to you, Greg. Thanks, Peter. Ian? Thanks. I'll be very brief because I'm, I'm very keen to hear these, these questions. I mean, just to agree with, with Andy and Peter here, I mean, the, the dynamics of inequality within these regions is stark, and the report lays this out. And it has a whole array of different implications for health outcomes, nutrition, uh, child survival, and so on. But, but also, these inequalities create new politics. And this isn't necessarily covered in the report, but I think it's worth reflecting on. Uh, in relation to this whole question of individualization, changing land tenure regimes, enclosure, land grabbing, and so on. Because as new elites are created, they have political power that can impose new forms of production, new forms of land use. And of course, we haven't as yet mentioned much about the state. These are often in the marginal areas of the state, but the state is still interested in these areas, partly because uh, for tax you know, for tax collection reasons, partly in order to uh, assuage um, conflict and so on. So there are, there are new political and power relations that are emerging, which are, which are direct result of these changing social relations and, and increasing inequalities at the local level. So the new politics of pastoral areas, I think, is one to watch and one that development agencies and others engaging in these areas need to think hard about. But I'll leave it there. Back to you, Greg. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, so let me move uh, directly to our questions so we can get in as many as we can. So first, uh, the first question's for Ian, and here it is. With the amount of spontaneous privatization, local elite grabbing of productive lands, and continued state and private grabbing of the range lands, real and future threats for irrigation, mining, et cetera, is it time to revisit pastoralist land rights through some form of group land certification, registration, legal recognition? That's a big question. Um, and it follows on very much from what we were just discussing, because these processes of so-called land grabbing, or resource grabbing more generally, uh, are emerging out of different political processes. I think, as Andy originally said, we both have external investors coming into these areas claiming land, but also significantly and not so high profile in the media and other commentary on, on land uh, grabbing uh, debates. There is this, this process of internal land grabbing as the emergence of new elites. And of course, these present different challenges for how to respond. Um, for external, in relation to external investors, Notionally, there should be processes of free prior informed consent, appraisals of investment opportunity, environmental assessments, and so on, which are supposed to be part and parcel of uh, investments, which should offset the worst, uh, the worst impacts. As we know, this doesn't always happen, and as we know, there are processes of dispossession uh, and enclosure that happen without any of these safeguards. But in a way, the more challenging question, and this relates to the point I just made about poli new politics of pastoral areas, is when local elites are part and parcel of this, uh, this process. So who then is the pastoral community that is going to come up with communal uh, management systems uh, to protect collective rights if this so-called community is so differentiated and so divided economically and politically? because very often these, these interventions uh, are premised on the assumption that there is a singular pastoralist community that wants to define, defend its rights uh, collectively uh, in that simple way. 
That said, I think there are uh, Im important initiatives that we need to think about, and actually uh, the Horn and East Africa can learn a lot, I think, from West Africa, where initiatives such as protect protecting migration corridors in northern Cameroon or the Code Rural in uh, Niger, Mali, and so on, have tried to develop more integrated territorial systems to protect pastoralist rights. But we also know that uh, collective management, uh, group ranches and so on in Kenya and elsewhere haven't necessarily resulted in, in, uh, in, in that sort of support and in, in the end have become individualized and privatized. So I think it's a, real, it's a real issue out there and one that needs some serious policy thinking. We now have the FAO's overarching framework on the voluntary guidelines uh, for, for land tenure, which I think provide a, an overarching framework for governments to think about, uh, about land issues. And I think for those of us working in pastoral areas, thinking through how the voluntary guidelines translate for pastoral areas is, is a really big and important challenge now. So I'll leave it for there, there for that one, but there's much more to be said. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, that's a it's a it's a huge question. For uh, this this question's for Andy. Uh, education seems to be a critical development strategy for these areas, but why are governments so fixated on fixed point delivery systems which aren't well suited to pastoralist households? The same question applies to health services and veterinary services. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. Well. Um, Perhaps to, to start, I think in, in terms of veterinary services, I'm, I'm not sure that, that all governments are uh, fixated on fixed point delivery systems because we have seen some, some very important growth in, in privatized and community-based delivery systems on the veterinary side and, and some successes there. And perhaps one of one of the issues is that some of the experiences with with designing veterinary services in pastoral areas haven't transferred easily to to health services um, or education. So on the on the animal health side, I think there was a recognition that pastoralists were mobile, that service design needed to be different to take account of their mobility to enable them to to access services at different times of year and so on. And this way of thinking really hasn't hasn't transferred over to to education or health. Um, so generally what, what we see is that when governments do get around to to a policy position where they say, yeah, we really need to to start supporting health and education in pastoral areas. They use models of delivery which are based on, on fixed urban located clinics and schools and so on. And the general problem is that they, they tend to just transfer delivery systems from, from rural agricultural areas with, with relatively uh, high concentrated sedentary populations to pastoral areas. And those, those delivery systems don't work well in pastoral areas and they're, they're expensive to, to run. Um, and yet we see this consistently, uh, not only programs run by government, but also programs that uh, are supported by donors. So it's an issue. Um, and although there have been, I think, some good some good experimentation of different delivery systems in health and education around more mobile systems and so on. Unfortunately, those don't seem to have been scaled up or received the kinds of, of policy support they need to, to normalize them uh, and so on. I hope that at least um, answers some of the question. Back to you. Oh, thanks much, uh, Amy, for that one. So next question is for Peter. Um, Peter, if we assume that a large number of poor pastoralists who have exited pastoralism are not going to return to pastoralism, 
then what kinds of infrastructural skill training and other support should be provided to them? How do we prioritize programs and investments for them and for the places they live? Uh, thank you, Greg. Um, I, um, you know, I think we can we can learn a lot um, actually from small town planning and from from areas that are not really within within the so-called pastoral sector. Um, but there are there are a lot of things, and in, in the report hints that. I mean, the, the one one that that you know, because uh, I'm here at Emory, which is a very big public health. Uh, uh, portfolio is is the health implications of settlement in towns and so on, sanitation, uh, increased exposure to uh, to uh, disease like malaria and so on. So I think there's a lot that can be done there. Um, and then in terms of of skill training, uh, and and Andy just dealt with education. Um, there again, I think it's, you know, again, there's a lot that actually can be done um, vocationally. Um, but I think there's also, again, uh, on, on the point of the fact that these small towns and settlements where these poor pastoralists and others are going are still part of that regional economy. So, so things in, in um, uh, ways to improve milk trading, um, perhaps even improving the food safety of milk, milk trading and so on. Are, are things that can can strengthen these beneficial links to pastoral area, but it's a, it's a huge question, especially when you consider the fact that a lot of this is youth and women, and um, and, and so on. So I will uh, I will leave it at that, and uh, hopefully get a few other questions. Back okay. To you, yeah. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, we're squeezing up against it now. So let me, if I can, I'm going to go back to Andy. And Andy, let me give you this question that just came in. So how can we clearly differentiate? between pathways to resilience and community-based disaster preparedness programs? Um, well, well, I guess one, one response is that depending on how you interpret resilience and resilience programming, um, one of the advantages of, of resilience thinking is that it brings together development and disaster response, disaster preparedness and so on into a single programming framework and approach instead of having it separate. So when we look at, um, you know, resilience programming experiences so far, what, what people will often say is one of the advantages is that, is that resilience framing tends to bring the disaster stroke emergency folks and the development folks together into one kind of uh, overall approach that, that better integrates and links the two things together. So so my view is is that you know drought management should be integrated into long term development policy programs and so on. In which case, I'm not sure the question applies, or at least perhaps in the way it was intended. <laughs> Back to you. Thanks, Andy. It's a tough question, but I think you you you, you nailed a little bit on the linkages between uh, relief and development, which has been important. So the last question is for Ian. Uh, Ian, what about collective action where small herders come together to improve their market access? Well, I think collective action, as people have mentioned before, has been central to how uh, markets have operated in pastoral areas uh, for a very long time. Um, of course, what's been happening with the differentiation of markets and the, the way that uh, significant proportions of, of livestock are going off, off to centralized markets or export markets is that these, these, uh, these market chains have become more individualized and more controlled by particular brokers and traders and so on. But actually, our focus on export and our focus on these large high value market chains 
means that uh, we often forget the fact that actually the largest volume of livestock trade is going on in small markets where this form of collective action is 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 ongoing. Um, and actually, there's a lot of opportunity for supporting small and informal so-called bush markets uh, that supply uh, regional towns or, or even going as far as capital cities. And I think there's, there's a lot of investment opportunities for donors, NGOs, and others around both market organization, but also uh, price signaling, market information, uh, and so on, uh, to support this more informal market trade where a lot of the economic activity uh, is actually happening. And particularly with a gender focus and a youth focus, thinking about ways in which uh, women and younger people can become engaged and profit from these, these market interactions uh, since they're very often excluded from the, the large uh, high profile value chains. So let me leave it there and back to you, Greg. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Peter, and thanks, Andy. Uh, it was a great conversation. We've kind of we've uh, violated the uh, major rule of these webinars by going over time, but that's how it is because there were so many questions, and I think the subject is so relevant. Um, last word I would say is just that uh, one, you can see on your screen right now uh, emails for all the participants, and if you have questions and you didn't get your question answered, uh, please feel free to email us, and we'll do our best to to give you an answer. Um, and finally, I think the last word I would say is that lots of effort is put into, uh, obviously lots of money and effort is put into the disaster side of drought side and of, um, of the pastoralist areas, but clearly there is a great deal of work to be done on the development side and making sure that those two sources of funds uh, work as well as they can together uh, so that um, those of us that are engaged in this uh, enterprise uh, do the best we can for those that we seek to serve. So with that, I'll thank all of you for staying on the line and joining us today. And we hope to see you for the third um, of our uh, webinar in this series. Thank you very much and uh, good day. <laughs>